Celebrating Japanese June, today we are looking at Sanchiro by Natsume Soseki. Can you say it again? I love when you say it. It sounds so cool. <laughs> it's probably not correct. I, I am not fluent in the language, but I do love studying it. Sanchiro. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Sensei Una. And I, what student crypto? Gakuse. Kakuse? <laughs> Ga. Oh, Ga. Y yeah, sure. We'll go, we'll go with that. All right. <laughs> If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to literature talking about some of the most important stories that have influenced even today's writers. If you're down for a conversational approach, we will leave a link down below for you to subscribe, as well as a link to our Patreon to help us support and keep the channel running. And as always, we start off with publication information. Shanshiro was a serialized work that was published in a Japanese newspaper from September 1st through December 29th in 1908. And our version was translated by Jay Rubin. Not Natsume Soseki, actually a pen name with his birth name being Natsume Kinosuke. This is a man that is so popular in Japan, his face was on the thousand yen note for a period of time, actually. Wow, that's awesome. Well, he deserved it. He's an amazing author. So something that I'm not totally familiar with or even comfortable with because I don't know how to read or speak Japanese well enough is there actually used to be an older literary style, according to some of my research. And what happened was this Genbun Ichi, it's a newer literary style, kind of got ushered in. The old style was, we don't talk like that anymore. So why do we write like, why do we write like it, right? We should write how we talk. We should write colloquially. And this is kind of being ushered along in this time. And Soseki is kind of at the forefront of, of kind of ushering this along. So it would be difficult for people of the time period because he's writing something that almost seems futuristic in this new language when he should be writing something more appropriate to his time. No, quite the opposite, actually. It's the old stuff that people didn't really know how to work with. And this is making it more accessible by making it the colloquial language approach, actually. Okay. To me, this actually feels, I would say, even maybe in a little, little bit of Dostoevsky feel to it, where you have these moments of humor and then are just super pleasurable, but then it'll just hit you with like this deep philosophical movement. It might it might flow a little bit different than a Dostoevsky novel, but it has those elements of approaching who are we as a society? Where are we going? And Soseki is not shy at all to take stabs and jumps at the different types of Japanese peoples at the time. Yeah, and for me, being a historian, I love fictionalized history. And when reading this, I, I felt like I was gaining more insight to the time period that this is being written about. But also, I had a feeling about this book that is what you describe me as how I enjoy books is this very much was a, a peak and valley read. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I, I would feel the same way. And with that, I feel that it made me a better history teacher because I can use this as something as kind of a crutch to lean on because I was not there. I don't know as much about Japanese history as I like to as a teacher. And if a student is saying, you know, I'm struggling with this information, I can direct them to this book and say, hey, here's a novel that will give you some more insight that would allow you to write better on an essay or maybe have a better understanding of this historical time period. And that's a good point, because he is a Meiji-era writer. He's writing what he knows, what he sees at the time. And sometimes it comes off as very prophetic. There are things that he is writing pre-World War I and II that seem to kind of come true about what will Japan come, what will be Japan's struggles. And he's writing about all of this stuff at the late era. I mean, you got to remember Meiji ends in 1912, some would argue a little bit later, and this, was, this came out in 1908. So this was pre moving into the next era if you will and he's born and watches all of these things uh become abolished in terms of like you know the feudalism but he sees at the age of like eight or nine i'd have to go look it up he sees samurais disbanded right he sees the old way of japan and how things were done go away and he sees this rapid industrialization crypto my history teacher what would be your overview of, of what people need to know about what was Japan and the Meiji era all about? Because so much of that is just philosophically woven into this book that we have to have this conversation to have a really enriched and full view of this novel, I feel like. All right, so we're going to take a break here and go to Crypto's Corner of History for a little bit. This 
era defines not only Japan, but becomes one of the most important time periods and cultural shifts and industrial shifts for Japan and Asia as a whole as well. Most historians will agree, as you said, that the Meiji is a time period from 1868 to 1912. This is going to be the rapid change in Japan, not only industrially, but culturally as well. To understand why these changes take place, we kind of have to step back a little bit and go to Japan pre-1868 to understand that Japan was an isolated country for hundreds of years. Japan is a small island nation off the coast of mainland Asia, and so it developed very similarly to places like Korea and Vietnam and China, but it also had its own uniqueness to it as well. One of the key uniquenesses is going to be that it had a feudal system that is very very unique, but similar to what we see in Europe as well. Because of this, they develop a very rigid agrarian society with their limited land space. Geography, geography, geography. And with that, we see the rise of these leaders known as shoguns. Again, very similar to what we see in Europe. The big difference here is that we're going to see the Dutch Revolution happen in the early 1800s in Great Britain, and that information is not going to make its way into Japan until after Commodore Perry makes his way in Japan, opening the doors of Japan to trade. And then we're going to see that big tonal shift that we see represented in this novel. And what's important to point about that is Europe had time to evolve this. They had hundreds of years, and it expanded very slowly and pushed its way out. And to what you're saying here, it hits Japan, and it becomes one of those, oh no, we have to catch up very fast. We do not have what the rest of the world has, and we're going to be left behind. And that is important to note out that not only do they have to catch up quickly, that Japan is able to catch up faster than any other country in the world. And by the time we hit World War I in 1914, and why this book feels so prophetic, is Japan will become the most industrialized nation in all of Asia, and arguably one of, if not the most industrialized nation by World War II arguing against maybe Germany or the United States, which is an incredible change for every aspect of these people's lives. And we can see that in our main character in this story of how it's going to affect them dramatically. Right. Japan's asking the question, well, what do we import from the West? You know, we have to import this industrialized strategy. We Maybe we have to import art. Maybe we have to import teachers. That's something that maybe you didn't know is that they were using foreign teachers because guess what? These textbooks ain't written in Japanese. They have to be taught. And English became one of the most important languages to study and learn. And Soseki himself, as, as a human being, experienced the same thing going through school, right? You had to learn English in order to understand some of these textbooks and to teach it from that perspective. And you'll see some of this conversation pop up through the book of what does it mean to be Japanese now? How do we retain who we are as a peoples, but still import the good and industrialized things of the West, but keep the Japanese spirit, to quote a famous saying from them from the time? And that's kind of our launching point into the novel, right? We have this good old boy that's coming in, you know, this country bumpkin, and he is moving through this world. So we're leaving kind of the spoiler-free area, and we're going to talk more about the plot, but you, you can't really spoil this novel per se, right? I mean, this isn't a plot-driven piece. This is understanding the characters, understanding Japan at the time, right? Because Sanshiro, our fish out of water, is sent to the big university in Tokyo. Right? He's given a chance to pursue education. And what happens when he gets there? He's scared by the loud sounds. He's unable to keep up with his notes in school. He's seeing Japan happen so fast that he can't keep up. And he's, he's maybe terrified of all of these new technologies and things that are being introduced to them as a country. And we meet people such as Nonomiya, who is the family friend, who's involved in these advanced science experiments that he's unable to comprehend and such. I feel like Sanchiro does a really good job of being like the sounding board of how does Japan react to all of these things being introduced to them. I think it comes out of the idea that they don't even know who themselves are. Nonomiya is respected outside of Japan, but his own countrymen really can't identify with him anymore. So where is anybody in the place of their own world at this point in time, especially at a place like a university? And then we have Hirota, who is the Japanese high school teacher who lacks ambition, but has the intelligence 
right? He also lacks the comfort with modernity, right? What like a lot of the Japanese individuals were kind of experienced at this time. And then you have Haraguchi, who brings in the art conversation, right? Is our art good enough or is it not good enough? And where is our art going to fit into this? Or is it even going to fit at all? Should we do away with our art and move to something that is more westernized or a different style? And then his life keeps clashing with Mineko and Yojiro, his two friends uh, and potential love interest, where he has a hard time balancing his societal expectations, she does too, along with what she wants to be. Versus Yojiro, who's going to be what he wants to be <laughs> and doesn't care about societal expectations. And that's probably the highlight of, of this book for me, is that hypervillain conversation. So how do we break down this story? Because it's not a plot piece. It is absolutely 100% characters that, to me, it, it doesn't sound right to say they boil down to themes, but a lot of how I reacted to the story felt very much like how the people of Japan at that time were reacting to specific westernization moments. You're going to take in some things that you would agree with, and then other things you're going to be like, eh, I could have left that. So let's break this down within the lens of the Meiji era, okay? And there's three things that I kind of wanted to talk to you about today, which is the rapid industrialization, how that's represented in the novel, the influence of Western art, okay, as well as the education and kind of that concept of the hypervillain and understanding who Japan was at a time. And I think these all are really interesting aspects, though I know there's tons more that we could talk about. Agreed. <laughs> but I think it's easy to boil it down to those three because that may have been Soseki's point of the novel, the grand scheme of things. So first up, rapid industrialization. We have quotes like, Meiji thought had been reliving 300 years of Western history in the space of 40. I don't know if I agree with those numbers exactly, but <laughs> but I get the concept, right? This is a story that is self-aware of how fast Japan is going to have to catch up. This is written late Meiji specifically. So he does have he has seen this firsthand, seeing the samurais disbanded and such, seeing the effects of the fallout of the feudal system. And he gets to kind of inject all of that fear and such into the novel. I would say that in a 200 span compared to about a 50 year span is realistic. Japan had just a couple of dozen miles of railroad line at the beginning of 1870s. And by the start of World War I, they will have over 7,000 miles of rail line. That's how fast they were able to industrialize. And that's just one example of how much they will change the face of their island. And I feel like in the mind of someone living in this era, you have all of this fear of being able to keep up. And I think we see that with Sanchiro, who I think is supposed to be representative of that, because he's struggling to keep up in his school studies. He's, he's furiously trying to write these things down. And in his school studies, he's even reminded about this, this rapid westernization with quotes like, A single bone of the cannon shattered at the dreams of Uraga. Which, if you didn't know, is the reference to commander perry that that crypto was talking about earlier this is all kind of in the back of their minds they're being reminded of how they're being forced into this approach in this modernization because if you don't get modernized in this era what happens left behind or even worse colonized perhaps too just depending on how history flew for you as a as a country and as an island yeah and i i just i love how prophetic this is because i think that a lot of people out today can relate to this of if you don't modernize and get on the internet and get a cell phone and have a digital bank account where your paycheck is direct deposited nobody gives out checks anymore you know very few people send checks in you pay all your bills online if you don't do that you're going to be left behind so i think that we can be empathetic for what these japanese people were going through in the early 20th century so let's move to what was the heart of the book for me, something that really resonated. And this is kind of the Dostoevsky moment, right? You had in Crime and Punishment, you had the Napoleonic Man speech, which is just what the whole novel just rotates around, where without it, I don't know if it's as obvious, I don't know if it's as easy to grab the point, but there's something about that speech in Crime and Punishment that just made it become one of the most important classics of all time. For me, that speech in, in this book is the hypervillain talk. When you have the quote, the only hypervillains we needed in the old days were feudal lords and fathers. Now, with equal rights, everybody wants to be one. Not that it's a bad thing, of course. We all know. Take the lid off something that stinks, and you find a manure bucket. Tear away the pretty formalities, and the bad is out in the open. 
Oof. And this was just so remarkable to me because a lot of countries, to your point earlier, have gone through that that ripping away of the feudal system, right? We we talked just now about Russia having the serfdom being pulled away. We in America experienced slavery and what that meant for that abolishment and the road to get past that that we're still struggling with today. Here, Japan is talking about it too, where it used to be the feudal lords and the you know the shoguns that you were talking about earlier that had all the power. They were the ones that could be evil and that could be self-interested. Most of the the, the working class underneath it, in terms of the samurai, interesting enough, you, you talked about the class system earlier. The merchants are the lowest class back in the feudal era of Japan. Like the people that made the money, oddly, <laughs> were the <laughs> ones that are looked down upon the most. Which is so unique so, to the whole rest of the world as well. Right. Right. So normally when you when you rip that that system away, okay, all these people that were supporting the people that could be self-interested, now their their business could start to sink as well because now they can become self-interested. And what does that mean when you put it in the world of a society worldview, right? How do you start pushing for yourself, but also maybe not become too selfish or greedy? How do you still live in the ecosystem of other people? And now you start to see more of the stink that was hidden before with that class system that suppressed that. What a amazing philosophical point to bring up that I think has to resonate not just with Japan, but anyone who's going through this type of a shift. I think this comes back to a lot of what Japanese find to be important in their culture. Looking back at Shinto or Buddhism or is the loyalty to one's shogun or the samurai or the emperor, because we're going to see that resonate in Japanese history into World War One, post-World War One, World War Two, And even today, you know, loyalty to the country is, is very, very important to those people. And it's explored, I think, a little bit even with Hirota when he's talking about with his job. He's like, well, um, take my teaching, for example. My real purpose is to make a living. But the students wouldn't want to see it that way. That is incredibly a very true humanistic statement where we dress up so much of what we say. Why do you work? The answer a lot of time is to make money. <laughs> but we, we put on these facades of, and it's true, I am shaping the future of humanity with with teaching and molding these students minds you know when you work as a pharmacist you talk about how you might be trying to help people by putting the drugs together to help them but there's a lot of profit in that organization that you're working for too i'm not trying to come down on those jobs i'm just trying to think of jobs where you point out like some of the obvious benefits that you have but we hide the money concept in the same way the feudal system in japan pushed down the people that made money the merchants right we will eschew the money and greed side, but elevate kind of the humanitarian elements when the reality is, is that you you probably are doing it more for the the more self-interested side, the hypervillain. And I can't help but make me, it forces you to look at yourself, I think. And, and, and to have that honest conversation can be very difficult sometimes. Agreed. I think we've come back to education, which he's going to the university, he's becoming educated. And as a teacher, personally, I think about this, I got into teaching because I wanted to help kids. The paycheck is something that's a benefit. But a lot of people always point out, oh, well, a lot of people just want to be teachers because you get summers off and you you know have this big, huge break and you get all of these benefits and everything else. And yeah, you may not get paid as much, but then it always comes back in modern times about the money. And that's definitely something that can't be ignored. I mean, yeah, doctors do it to save lives because they love people, but they sure charge a lot of money to save lives. Again, not downing that profession. But I think when we see here that Japan's growth is going to have to get past that concept of having a negative attachment to money if they're going to prosper and indeed they will again why i just i love this piece so much is how much he was able to call out of what will happen in japan 30 40 years before it does and let's talk about art a little bit too so we're talking a little bit about the education and the self-interest now let's talk about the importing of other cultures into the country right there's the beauty conversation of Okay, Western have those big eyes. Why? And in this book, they write about, well, that's all they have. We in Japan, even our gods, are no uh, performances in kabuki theater. We all have the smaller eyes, right? And they talk about why is there such a different view on what beauty means between our two different cultures, basically. And when we say West, that's a very broad term. Uh, I actually learned recently that West to some people just means America. Uh, West in the context of uh, more of like the socio-economical teaching is, is basically 
Europe and, and further. So, so we're including that when we say West, by the way, if there's any confusion. But we have eventually stumble upon this stray sheep conversation, which I think is the second point of this novel that is just so interesting. And I think I think the the novel could almost just hang on to the hypervillain and the stray sheep concepts. And those two pieces alone carry the whole novel. They're so strong, in my opinion. Because with Mineko and the concept of stray sheep, we have the concept of, okay, we are sheep. And I don't think they mean that in terms of the Western term of like, we're, we're meant to be slaughtered. I don't think it's meant to be, you know, we're herded a specific way. But they talk about how societal norms and traditions are what kind of have to usher them along. And how long will it be before something comes along and takes their freedom away? And that's what's the prophetic thing to this, because you have to remember this is late Meiji era, right? This is pre-World War I. This is pre-World War II. Japan's experiencing all these wars. Well, they talk about the Russo War earlier, in the, in the, uh, they had just gotten out of the war with uh, China, wasn't it? Yes. And the industrialization and the modernization of their army was a big part in this story, too. But what does it mean when we're talking about this of how long is it before someone comes along and takes our freedom away? We are sheep until either society expects us to act or change or perform differently or before other countries and world pressures potentially force that upon us as well. For me, the stray sheep really came down to how life changed for Maneko and how Japan is going to make different choices for their individuals. Maneko had to marry for convenience uh, practical reasons. She was not able to marry for love. And that might be a tonal shift for them as a whole. And are we going to be led down these Western paths? And to combine it with that earlier point about the hypervillain, Yojiro, would he ever marry for societal reasons? No. <laughs> He'd push for what he wanted, for what he thought was best, as opposed to Mineko, to your point, is shackled to societal norms and expectations. I think another way that Soseki kind of drops in the art is the dream sequence with Hirota and what he's trying to accomplish with what are the choices that they're going to make or what does it actually mean for them. Right, because he has that dream about seeing that girl when she's 12 or 13. 20 years later, she's still 12 or 13, right? <laughs> and she makes that she makes that comment you know, trust me, I'd love to freeze my age at a specific time, not 12 or 13. <laughs> but she says right. she has that comment about being a painting versus being a poem, right? Are you something that's created and left and preserved like a painting in a museum? Or are you a poem like poetry, something that evolves over time that can grow and change with things? Um, and I think that's kind of what Japan might be asking themselves. Are we paintings? Are we poems, right? This is what Japan is now, but it can't, that can't be what Japan is 70 years down the road. Right. And it's only through hyper villains to our previous point. They're the ones that built Japan. They're the ones that were so interested in growing and pushing and getting more in a sense that they're the ones that actually did achieve more for Japan in a self-interested way. They're not necessarily bad. They're not necessarily wrong. They're not trying to destroy the painting, but they know that they can't stay that way. And that's what the conversation is, I think, with art in Japan as a whole, is the hypervillains have to push Japan forward to be something new and different and figure out what the new Japan's going to be. I find it interesting that it's Hirota, of all people, that is bringing this up because he seems to be holding on to the old of, well, he saw her at 12 or 13. It's been these many years of past, and he still sees her that way. But he's the one that is trying to encourage the younger students, isn't he, to look forward of how are we going to blossom into these new Japanese people in the future. It's very interesting to me. And can you even stop it? Right, because it's worth pointing out that we learn that he saw her at the 1889 Constitution with with the assassination, right? So can you stop the progress? Is is maybe another way to look at that? And one of the concepts I think we have to think about is: Would the changing of Japan even work? Would it be necessary? Would it help? Or to your point earlier, are they going to fall into the trope of what happens as we see in historically Africa? India, China. So they're, they're seeing the benefits to moving forward, but they don't know how to do it. And what's crazy is this was written in 1908, right? It's so easy to look at this with modern lenses and be like, oh my gosh, look how prophetic this part is. But he's writing this in the turmoil of late Meiji, which is just 
amazing to me. Let's talk about the education just a little bit too, because I think that's worth kind of mentioning is that Japan at the time, like we talked about earlier, was importing a lot of the Western education, Western textbooks in order to teach people. And we even see that conversation with the teachers of when do we kick the Westerners out, right? When can Hirota, a local Japanese person who is intelligent, but he's not ambitious as part of the problem too. He's not taking that position or taking that role is perhaps how I interpreted Hirota's role of we need to step into the opportunity to push Japan forward as opposed to using Westerners to pull up our education, which might have been lacking under the feudal system. But that's a little that's a little misleading because Japan actually has promoted arts, it has promoted education on some levels, much different than perhaps some other countries did with their feudal systems. But but it it still needs to be brought up to 300 years of information that's been lacking because they've been so isolated as a country. For me, I feel like Soseki here is playing a little bit of devil's advocate or that he's poking fun at not only himself and Japan, but he, he he's taking this, this stance and saying, look, if we're going to do our own thing, we can't have the Westerners push us around. They came in and forced us to industrialize, and now we see the benefits of it, and we want to move ahead as whatever our nation is going to be. But I feel like, in my interpretation, is that Soseki is he, he's he's poking fun and saying that if we just allow them to do this to us, we're no longer going to be Japan. We're no longer going to be the people that we want to be. We can adopt what they have given us to make it our own, but we have to eventually stand on our two feet. And I think it's kind of the combination of education and that stray sheep togetherness of that he's trying to point out and, and give that prophetic idea to his people and say, other, either you're going to be Japanese, Western Japanese, or you're just going to be Western. Yeah, I can see that for sure, because a lot of the people in this novel are between worlds, right? Sanshiro stuck between the old world and new world. You had uh, characters that were learning, you know, taught in, in or edu were educated in Paris, bought Japanese food in foreign lands and brought it back. Like, there's a lot of this in-between concept, and even Hirota himself, right? He read tons of books, right? But he did nothing with it. Right? He didn't educate his local Japanese or his other people and bring them up to your point. It's kind of like you got to move forward or otherwise you're just reading from the Western art and not using it and, and implementing it in a sense. Not that they want to use it against them, but it's, it's sink or swim. And he's, he has chosen to sink. And I think that um, Soseki wrote him in there on purpose to say that it's going to have to be the younger generations that are going to do this. The older generations are too much stuck in their old ways, and they're not going to move us forward. Otherwise, we are going to be dominated by something that we may not want, or they do want. Uh, it, it'd be really cool to be able to have him see what Japan has come today, <laughs> whether he would like it or be horrified. It'd be really cool for him to be able to be like, well, I was right on that and wrong on that. <laughs> I think he would be proud of where his country would be, just, just knowing from Soseki's kind of passion, the way that he wrote from. I think he wanted to write a warning to his fellow countrymen, but we've kind of skipped over just how funny this novel was all along the, the way, like from the opening scenes of throwing food out the window and it coming back and hitting her in the face. And uh, we'll just have random spouts of just diarrhea. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the book is very funny, but it has so much uh, educational potential too. the way it talks about things, the way it talks about literature being the great mirror of life and not just something that's taught in a school that's something i think probably resonated with you and i a little bit more than than others because we do believe that literature is this great tool to teach us about ourselves to cause you know these these ringings of the bells to societies to say guys this this is something we need to wake up and take seriously and i can't help but feel that maybe soseki uh, position this novel in a way that like he, he inserted his philo philosophy in a way that he was trying to, I think, speak to the, the Japanese persona as a whole. And it wasn't just a, Hey, I want to write something that sells well. He wanted to write something that did well to, to the people and their mind and what he thought Japan needed. For me, I, I love the story. As a historian, I see the potential of using this in my classroom and being able to give a fictionalized 
history of Japan and the time period and also the the lessons that they had to go through, the growing pains that they had to go through, and what that can mean not only for Japan and its history, but for us and our history and where we move forward. One of our greatest strengths as a nation is the diversity that we have. And if we embrace that diversity, we will become stronger. As I pointed out already in this video, that Japan became the most industrialized nation in Asia. And then one of the top three most industrialized nations in the world, the fastest of anybody, faster than Great Britain, faster than the United States, faster than Germany, faster than anybody. And they became better for it. And today, Japan is one of the strongest, most industrialized, technologicalized countries in the world. And if we want to keep up, we have to embrace the ideas that Soseki laid down in this book, educationally, philosophy, all of that. So our goal is to talk about some of the educational moments in this story. We like to bring out some of the intertextual conversations and perhaps some of the historical context in which it's written. And I think we've done you know, a, a decent job of that. We have, I have notes in here about women's society. I have notes about literature, uh, the translations, and what does it mean to translate you know, some of these cultural things. There, there's plenty of more conversation to happen on this book. And, and I think you know, there's maybe we'll do some more videos if you guys want to see it. Let's do that. But let's talk about I think we'll move into kind of like our subjective wrap up and ratings where we just talk about how the book hit us too, because we've praised a lot of the book too, where there's some other parts of here that we didn't care for. So this is going to be more of our subjective things of how it hit us. You know, we're going to leave a Soseki playlist down below because we are doing Kokoro and we are going to be doing I Am A Cat at some point in the future. And uh, we have a Patreon down below if you are looking to support us in our endeavors. Let's move into our wrap up and ratings. For me, I don't know if I want to give this one a number. At the beginning of the talk, I said that this is a peak and valley, and I'm a peak and valley reader, raider, whatever. Um, this one was messy at times. It was so prophetic, and then we have diarrhea jokes, and then it was so prophetic, and he's throwing <laughs> his lunch around, and then it's so prophetic, and we have just ridiculous ensue. Um, the characters felt choppy to me at times where I kind of knew where they were going, and then they do a 180 on me, and they change everything about themselves, which I think is indicative of the novel itself. Uh, we started this looking at just the first short story, but we were so intrigued, we wanted to read the rest of it. And that does say something in itself, is that it is going to draw you along, and I think that you will enjoy it, but I don't know if you'll enjoy all of it. You're going to have to do a little bit of slogging until you get to a, oh, this is good. And then it's going to be a little bit of a grind. And then you're going to get some goodness out of it. So I, I don't know. I, there, there's no a number attached to this. I think that you're going to love it if you like Eastern culture. I think you're going to love it if you like Japanese culture. I think you're going to love it if you like studying history. Uh, it, 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 is a, it is, is a niche book, in my opinion. It's very uneven to your point too, right? Like for me, I agree with what you said that there, I don't want to use the word slog, but there's parts where I wasn't really interested in what was happening, both literature in terms of what it was saying and in terms of just the pleasure of reading. I didn't really care for some parts, but there's also those parts like the philosophical parts that I'm like, this is amazing. I am so glad I read this. And it depends on the type of reader that you are. If you want that just even keel, you know, push through the whole thing. I thought this part, I thought this book had some lower parts, but it's high parts is what, you know, I latched onto. Like I said, that stray sheep and the hypervillain talk were just mwah, beautiful, absolutely worth reading the book, in my opinion. But I would echo that there were some lumpy mo moments in this too, where it was kind of, it wasn't the most fun to get through at certain parts in time. So, you know, take that for what you, for what you will. I, if you're looking to get into more Asian literature, you have never read anything before. This isn't your starting point, in my opinion. No, no, no. The highs are highs, but the lows are low. <laughs> but but if you're like, I, for right now with my current reading exposure, I haven't read everything, right? If you're like, I really want to get, I love the Meiji Restoration. I just, I really want to know what the psyche and what the, the mentality was of that shift in that era and what the people felt. I have to throw the name into the bucket that this story encapsulates that really well. So 
take that for what it is. You know, what type of a reader are you and what you're looking for? Uh, I, I guess that's kind of my rating is this is it's an uneven experience. But I mm, those highs though, the hyper villain and the stray sheep. Mwah. So with that said, guys, we post videos every Monday and Thursday. We'd love to have you along in the journey. We will put a playlist and subscription button down below for you to join us in that adventure. Una out. Peace.